Kyle Miller's August Town, The Dangers of Prejudice. I'm very glad that you have decided to read this amazing novel about contemporary Jamaica. This novel is set against the backdrop of several neighborhoods in Kingston, Jamaica, during one of the most violent periods in that city's history. Additionally, the novel teaches us about the dangers of prejudice, particularly the type based around class and religion. For this presentation, I'll be explaining the most significant aspects pertaining to the novel. Before moving into the discussion, I want to offer some background about the author. Miller is part of a new generation of Caribbean writers who are changing how the world sees the region and its literary arts. While it may be too soon to consider his legacy, I feel that he has a masterful command of writing and develops complex themes and characters that will be appreciated over time. He has strong words to say about the Caribbean. Please use the link in the work cited to read his powerful essay, The White Women in the Language of Bees. August Town deals with the Rasta community around Kingston. It is set in the neighborhoods of August Town, two words primarily, and Mona secondarily. Taking place during the early 1980s, the novel shows the tremendous social stratification in Kingston based around class. During this period in Jamaican history, there was a spike in the homicide rate, nearly doubling from 20% per 100,000 to 40% per 100,000 in 1980. Moreover, this increase in the murder rate arrived with new economic and political policies that exacerbated the violence. According to researchers Michelle Monroe and Damian Blake, the 1980s is referred to as the lost decade, with the policies of privatization, liberalization, deregulation, and budget cuts leading to disastrous effects on the political economies of developing countries. Neoliberal reforms, i.e. reforms starting primarily from extra-governmental organizations within and from outside the country, led to stagnation and or decline in GDP growth an increase in unemployment, a drop in wages, reductions in public expenditure on social services, and an aggravation of poverty. These changes have had terrible consequences for Jamaica. Before the 1980s, high levels of violence were predominantly associated with how politics developed and was practiced at the community level, especially in garrisons. Today, high levels of violence are linked primarily to urban street gangs fighting over turf, the power of dons and battles over drug trafficking, and the rise of extortion rings. Neoliberalism has unequivocally played a role in the transformation of violence in Jamaica by number one, number one, increasing gang rivalries, number two, increasing gun crimes and homicides, and number three, transforming political enforcers into violent entrepreneurs. These changes dramatically transformed Kingston at the time of the novel. For another fictional portrayal of this time period, please read Marlon James's The Brief History of Seven Killings. For a comprehensive history of Kingston, please read Colin Clark's Kingston, Jamaica, Urban Development and Social Change, 1692-1962. In his updated book on Kingston, Colin Clark explains that at Independence in August 1962, Kingston accounted for 20% of the Jamaican population, whereas now it houses over 30% of the citizens of the nation. Demographically, the population of Kingston increased from 379,980 in 1960 to 868,000 653 in 2001. Such an increase creates serious strains across multiple areas throughout the community. For a detailed breakdown by neighborhood, please consult Colin Clark's Decolonizing the Colonial City, Urbanization and Stratification in Kingston, Jamaica. Another important contextual element in the novel is Rastafarianism. Miller shows the prejudice against this community, particularly in regards to mainstream Jamaican Christians. The character of the teacher demonstrates the painful truth that many within this group faced at the time and still face today. 
I will discuss this religion more in the upcoming slides. One very important element within the novel is the mythical development of the community in its belief. In the quote in the slide above, Miller shows the development of this community in the burgeoning Kingston area over the 20th century. Miller continues this paragraph with a darker turn. Like dark magic, that phrase seemed to draw into Augustown a heaviness and a heat and a rot. Rusting zinc fences now line the streets, and ratchet knives and machine guns have appeared in the hands of young men. A scar now defaces the overlooking hillside. Akin to some magical spell, the inner city of Augustown, with its poverty and violence, replaces the atmosphere of this neighborhood. The scar, referring to a natural geological formation in the area, is also a reference to the curse this community lives with now. Another important mythical element is the flying African in the character of the preacher. This myth of the flying Africans is essential to Africans living in the diaspora. It is prominent in many African-American works as well, most famously in Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon. In Augustown, this myth is explained thusly. The old people used to talk these things. They say many of us was born with the ability to fly, but we lose the gift when we start eating salt. It's like the salt weighs down. That's why Bucky Master makes sure to feed us salt fish and salt pork and all of them things, so that those of us who could fly would lose the gift. But sometimes a man or a woman might go into fasting, and when time they lose all the salt from them body, then that time they would start to float. And some of them did float all the way back to the motherland, back to Africa. They call them the Flying Africans. This belief that salt hinders this gift will be examined shortly in regards to Rastafarianism and its food observances. In the United States, there are WPA, Work Progress Administration, accounts of flying Africans. Together, these mythical foundations inform the novel and tell readers the complexities working within this community. Perhaps the most important contextual information to consider for the novel is Rastafarianism. To me as an outsider and scholar, I see Rastafarianism as another version of black liberation theology. In this theology, the oppression of peoples of colors, especially the descendants of the former enslaved, is chronicled within a biblical tradition. Most significant for this theology is the belief that black peoples have endured oppression, i.e. slavery, racism, etc., to become a chosen people, and that black people will one day receive salvation either through spiritual ascent, political independence, economic self-sufficiency, and or repatriation to the chosen land of Africa. There can be various combinations of these concepts in black liberation theology. In this way, Rastafarianism, while unique, fits into a tradition across the globe among the African diaspora. Specifically, one Rasta discusses what this religion meant to her once she converted. It was an education of black liberation. Liberation from racism, poverty, from the constant pain of ever being a stranger in strange lands, of ever being second class in a predominantly white world. Instead, Rastafari enabled a positive black consciousness with a God of her own. This reinvention of black consciousness perhaps a decolonization of the mind, to use Ngugi's concept, is truly revolutionary. Please bear with me as I elaborate. Adisa Odwele gives a strong explanation of this philosophy, noting its objectives. Reject the Western colonial philosophy, which was programmed into the minds of African peoples in the Americas. Purge the African mind of the European education which was implemented to control and mold them into the likeness of their captors, recreate their mental images, and create their own religious, economic, social, cultural, and political structures to replace those of the Western world system, labeled Babylon. 
In this slide, I list several key facts about this religion. Barbara Makeda Blake Hanna, a convert to the religion, explains how it changed her life. With Rastafari, I was reborn into a new way of looking at life. With a new education that enabled me to see not only a cultural equality, but a spiritual uniqueness, which could be worked for and attained. Indeed, this religion enacts a powerful change in its followers. Rastafarianism's most basic tenets vary, particularly because each community defines its own practices. However, several scholars have outlined some very important common elements. Leonard Barrett summarizes these well. As a messianic movement, its members believe that Haile Selassie, former emperor of Ethiopia, is the black messiah who appeared in the flesh for the redemption of all blacks exiled in the world of white oppressors. The movement views Ethiopia as the promised land, the place where black people will be repatriated through a wholesale exodus from all western countries where they have been in exile. This belief is often labeled as Ethiopianism. Overall, although each branch or community of Rastas has individual practices and principles of the religion, Leonard Barrett traces the first codified concepts of the movement back to December 16, 1933, where Leonard Howell outlined six main principles. 1. Hatred of the white race. 2. The complete superiority of the black race. 3. Revenge on whites for their wickedness. 4. The negation, persecution, and humiliation of the government and legal bodies of Jamaica. Number 5. Preparation to go back to Africa. And 6. Acknowledging Emperor Haile Selassie as the supreme being and only ruler of black people. These six tenets have evolved over time. Now the major pillars of the religion are the following. Haile Selassie is the living God. The black person is the reincarnation of ancient Israel, who, at the hand of the white person, has been exiled in Jamaica. The white person is inferior to the black person. The Jamaican situation is a hopeless hell, Ethiopia's heaven. The invincible emperor of Ethiopia is now arranging for expatriated persons of African origin to return to Ethiopia. In the future, blacks shall rule the world. Barrett elaborates on these principles in detail. However, there is one idea that needs more teasing out. According to Barrett, despite the rhetoric, the Rastafarians are not anti-white. The white race is seen as oppressors, but not all white people are considered evil. Each white person is accepted on merit until proven guilty of racism. Rastas admire the individual person before making assumptions about the entire group. This evaluation of the person speaks to another key idea in the religion, which is the Rasta formulation of the self. For instance, Rastas often use the phrase, I and I. Famous Rasta philosopher, poet, and scholar, Muda Baruka states, I and I is seeing the being, the manifestation of the supreme in man and woman and every living thing that exists. Moreover, the Rasta man, Muda Baruka says, is saying, the I is what you call spirit. So I and I is referring to the spirit in the man, which is the good in the man, so that this is the supreme being that he is referring to when he says I and I. He is going beyond the man when you see and in looking into the man that he should be. Another explanation states, the I is well total subject, subject with object, mover without being moved, God without being God. For to realize the self as subject is to be responsible for oneself, to be unmoved except by oneself. Man free, man free because God free, because the spirit of God, Jah, dwells within the spirit of man and woman is man. This belief should be one that everyone should support. Another significant belief is Babylon. In the quote above, it explains the basis for this term. Edmonds then elaborates on this concept, noting, 
and polarity is at the center of Rastafarian cosmology. It consists of Babylon, Jamaica, and the West on one side, and Zion, Africa, slash Ethiopia on the other. While Babylon is symbolic of negative forces, Africa, slash Ethiopia, is evocation of positive vibrations, pride, community, charity, and serenity. Therefore, the perception of life in Jamaica as a Babylonian, or exile experience, and of Haile Selassie as the Messiah slash the liberator of the African people constituted the perceptual reaction. Thus, the Rastafarian movement emerged among the poor, both urban and rural, in Jamaica in the early 1930s as a response to both the social realities in Jamaica and the crowning of Haile Selassie in Ethiopia. The term Babylon thus comes from the biblical explanation for the exile experience of transatlantic slavery. Indeed, the slave experience and its aftermath make Rastas see Jamaica as a belonging to an evil legacy. This belief results in the concept of Babylon. As a group, the Rastafarians see Jamaica as a land of oppression, Babylon. Their only avenue of escape is by supernatural means or by seizing the power and creating a utopia for the oppressed. For this reason, the act of deifying Selassie signals the break with the colonial establishment. It was a rejection of the white European religion and the whole cultural system that it legitimated. To put it another way, the Rastafarian movement of Jamaica is the most recent religious expression of a people who have experienced a bitter history of exploitation and oppression. Its emergence comes as a reaction not only to the native religions, which the Rastas see as unreal in the presence of formidable socio-political forces, but also against the missionary religions, which they view as the religious arm of colonial oppression. Evans explains, at the highest level of generality, Babylon is the forces of evil arrayed against God and their righteous, Selassie, Rastas, and the poor. The forces of evil, however, are not metaphysical entities but human attitudes and activities that are out of touch with the divine natural order. Human activity that is inimical to harmonious human relationships is a reflection of Babylonian values. This includes nuclear proliferation and the exploitation of natural resources, which threaten human existence and the continued viability of the world's ecosystems. In other words, Babylon, the term the movement uses to express the conviction that the social, political, and economic institutions that have shaped their historical and day-to-day -day experiences are evil and must be overcome. How these forces can be overcome emerges from various practices employed by Rastas. Before turning to key practices of this religion, I find that it is important to consider Halle Selassie. In the quote above, it explains the significance of this important man. His coronation as emperor of Ethiopia gave hope to oppressed blacks around the world. In Jamaica, this monumental occasion transformed many people, which made them see their own vision of a homeland was the biblical Ethiopia. Ethiopian images such as the lion and its national colors became important to this religion as a result. Indeed, the lion colors, and language are part of the rituals. Edmonds says, the adoption of the Ethiopian national colors of red, black, and green is another indication of the reappropriation of Africa slash Ethiopia. This adoption symbolizes Rasta's allegiance to Africa. These colors, along with gold, have become a Rastafarian trademark. Red represents the blood of those who gave their lives for freedom, especially the black slaves. Black represents African skin, holiness, fire, and creativity. Green is variously regarded as a symbol of Ethiopia, Jamaica, or Ganja. And gold symbolizes the Rastafarian faith, hope, or Jamaica. These symbols and colors dominate popular depictions of this religion. The lions do as well because to proclaim their identity, Rastas surround themselves with symbols and emblems depicting the lion. The lion evokes 
royalty, strength, and pride. Significantly, Barrett offers this distinction. It is the belief that Halle Selassie is God and the love and worship arising from that belief which makes one a Rastafarian. The practices in the following slides are aid in lessening Babylon and in praising Jah. The major practices of Rastafarianism are wearing dreadlocks, practicing idle living, engaging in moderate ganja smoking, and speaking dread talk. Barrett traces the developments of these practices. He summarizes the moral code set up by Sam Brown in 1966. No desecration of the figure of man, haircuts, tattoos, or branding of the flesh. Vegetarianism, no other god but Rastafari, love and respect the brotherhood of mankind, disapprove and abhor, hate, jealousy, envy, deceit, guile, treachery, etc. No modern day pleasures, avowed to create a world of one brotherhood, charity, adhere to the ancient laws of Ethiopia, do not accept the criticism of oppressors and resolve to love Rastafari. Returning to the no desecration of the figure of man, we can see the importance of dreadlocks in this religion. This slide above gives two takes on them. Edmonds elaborates further, however. As with other Rastafarian symbols, dreadlocks have multiple levels of significance. Aesthetically, they indicate a rejection of Babylon's de definition of beauty, especially as it relates to European features and hair quality. According to Rastas, hair straightening and skin bleaching by black people reflect a yearning for whiteness and are therefore symptomatic of alienation of one's African beauty. Against this background, dreadlocks signify the reconstitution of a sense of pride in one's African physical characteristics. Moreover, ideologically, dreadlocks express the Rastafarian belief in and commitment to naturalness. Trimming and combing, as well as straightening, are regarded as artificial because they change the natural looks and thus are prescribed by most Rastas. Dreadlocks thus bespeak the Rasta's uncompromising posture against the artificiality of Babylon. Dreadlocks also function as a mystical link between Rastas and Jah, or Earth Force. As with other religions worldwide, hair and its symbolisms provide a foundation for everyday living. Rastas maintain a strict diet, often eating mainly vegetables and small fish. Such foods were often not available in abundance during slavery, for the enslaved had to eat salted fish and preserved salty produce. As a reaction to this legacy, Rastas tried to eat a strict diet. Bear confirms the statement. The diet of the Rastafarians is very rigid. For example, meat as a whole is considered injurious to the body. As the quote above notes, the diet corresponds to trying to live a life away from Babylonian routines. Furthermore, central to the idea of idle living is the belief in herbal healing. Rastas believe that the entire universe is organically related and that the key to health, both physical and social, is to live in accordance with organic principles, as opposed to the artificiality that characterizes the modern technological society. Such a belief certainly provides someone with a strong foundation to live by. Ganja is essential to the lifestyle of Rastafarians because it frees the individual from oppressive thoughts and removes the negative forces of Babylon. Barrett notices that in the various communities where this movement began, Rastas probably began to use ganja as religious ritual in the early days. From an early ritual, it now has become necessary. Since then, it has become an inseparable part of the movement's worship and a ritual aid for meditation. It is referred to as ganja because it differs from other varieties of cannabis. In Jamaica, the term ganja represents a finer quality of the weed. Ganja, then, is the specially cultivated type of Indian hemp derived from the female plants and is used to be as much as four times stronger than the Mexican variety. I do not know if this fact is true still with the advent of new varieties of legalized cannabis. In Rastafarianism, ganja use became a reactionary device to the society and an index of an authentic form of freedom from the establishment.
Edmonds gives a detailed explanation of this belief. To the Rastafarians, the average Jamaican is so brainwashed by colonialism that his entire system is programmed in the wrong way. He is thus unable to perceive of himself as a black man. His response to the world is conditioned by unseen forces due to European acculturation. To rid his mind of these psychic forces, his head must be loosened up. Something done only through the use of the herb. The herb enables one to see one's true self. A true revelation of black consciousness brings about the proper love of the black race. It rids the mind of social and psychological hang-ups by altering one's state of consciousness, revealing the true nature of the world to the inner consciousness. Ganja makes the user arrive to a truer inner consciousness and rids the person of Babylonian influence. Therefore, as a source of illumination, Ganja has become an instrument in the war against Babylon and Babylonian consciousness. Its use, therefore, plays a major role in the de-alienation and decolonization of the African mind. This notion needs to be remembered to counteract stereotypes and misconceptions about Ganja and this community. Reggae was adopted for the Rastafarian movement, whose most famous practitioner was Bob Marley. Reggae encapsulates the language of Rastas and turns into an art. It has many functions. Barrett notes that the music of Rastafarians is not only an artistic creation in the Jamaican society, but an expression of deep-seated social rage. Moreover, Edmonds explains, as an anti-Babylon mu musical weapon, reggae has a threefold significance. First, Reggae is the medium through which the people are restored to self-awareness. Second, reggae is the medium through which people learn the truth about the system under which they live. Three, reggae is the medium through which the poor express their frustrations with and grievances against the political and cultural guardians of Jamaican society and through which they express their demand for change, and the need for a new ordering of society. In this way, reggae is an extension of literature, enlightening and inspiring its listeners. Remember to hear the words and process their meanings as you rock out. As a means to conclude this talk, I want to offer another explanation to understand this religion. Many of the practices and beliefs of the Rasta movement correspond to Milalism. According to Edmonds, Milalism, which has its roots in African religions, became an instrument for counteracting the sorcery of the slave masters. Milalism is often confused with or subsumed under Obey because it's an act of dealing with the spirit world. However, in the strictest sense, Mala is really the opposite of Obey. While Obey is the art of putting hexes on people, usually with evil intent, Milalism is the art of removing hexes or making people immune to them. The slaves believed that slavery was some kind of hex that their masters had placed on them. By their Mila art, they sought to break that hex. In a way, breaking the hex of Babylon, the ultimate goal of Rastafarianism, represents the tenets associated with ancient and contemporary examples of Milalism. In some, Rastafarianism contains a powerful and unique message. Again, I quote Edmonds. The Rastafarian reappropriation of Africa slash Ethiopia, exorcism of anansiism and embobbing in lionism, cultivation of dreadlocks, espousal of idol levity, and the development of dread talk are all indicative of Rastas stepping out of Babylon and revitalizing their own sense of identity. Taking this philosophy into account, we can see the dangers of prejudice toward these people in Miller's Augustown. Please consult these sources to learn more about Jamaica and Rastafarianism.